Our next speaker is coming to us from Western Australia. It's 10.30 at night there. Good, good evening, good night, Catherine. Catherine Worth, it's morning here. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can, hello, good morning. Okay, I'm sorry we, we got carried away with our Miller talk because it's very interesting information. So you take That's your it. time. Uh, you should be able to go ahead and share screen. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, it's all yours. Thanks, Catherine. Awesome. Hello, I'm Catherine Wirt. Firstly, thank you to the International Motor Racing Research Center for organizing the symposium and making it possible for me to present via Zoom today. I would like to begin today's presentation with a quote from Professor A.M. Lowe's article in the British Racing Driver Club's magazine, Speed, in August of 1935. Speed is important, not for its own sake, because it is the very basis of civilization. This statement addresses key themes of the 1930s I would like to discuss and unpack. The correlation between speed and civilization and how nation states use speed is represented in Grand Prix racing to showcase modernity and dominance in international politics and sport, particularly from 1933 through to 1939. So how did Lowe define the relationship between civilization and speed? From Lowe's perspective, civilization meant the spreading of knowledge and humane ideas across distances quickly. Speed was rapid transport, particularly that of cars, which would enable people and ideas to move. Alternatively, arising as comment, my research will argue that a nation's level of civilization rested on the ability to manufacture the world's fastest cars. Speed was the possession of Grand Prix cars and civilization was victory in these events. As motor racing is a sport that compares speeds between nations and nations level of technological civilization could be ranked. The structure of the presentation will begin with analyzing politics and nationalism in motor racing occurring in Nazi Germany. The silver arrows of Mercedes-Benz and auto union will be discussed, as well as the symbolism of the car for the regime. The hero narrative and legacy of auto union driver Bernard Rosa will also be considered. Following from this, the focus will shift to Britain in the period, a nation with no car and no funding to race at Grand Prix level. This section seeks to explore why Britain did not invest in motor racing, considering members of the racing community saw speed as a marker for civilization. The final section follows the relationship between Britain and Germany in the late 1930s in motor racing. The collision of Anglo-German relations will be showcased the 1938 Donington Grand Prix, the life of British Mercedes-Benz driver Richard Seaman, and the calls for an English auto union. The sources for this research primarily come from Britain and the British motoring press, and a few German sources are also included. On the 11th of February, 1933, during the opening addresses for the International Automobile and Motorcycle Exhibition, Adolf Hitler stated his intentions to align the automobile industry with aviation, to reduce the tax burden of the automotive sector, create a highway system, and promote German automobile sporting events. Occurring 12 days following Hitler's appointment as Chancellor of Germany, this speech became a turning point in Germany's commitment to automobilism and the rise of the Silver Arrows. The seriousness of motor racing for the Nazi government can be seen through the centralization of racing under the National Socialist Motor Corps, or NSKK. This enabled a controlled and unified racing team. This did also create militaristic ties to racing. One example is the paramilitary rank held by the drivers. Furthermore, the Nazi government was involved with subsidizing Mercedes-Benz and auto union from 1933 onwards. In a period following the Great Depression and war debt that Germany had, to provide any money to a racing team seems quite an expense to justify. Other countries did also fund their teams, including fascist Italy, and reports include the French government sponsoring their teams in the later half of the 1930s. There are numerous factors, including commercial policies that can explain this expense, 
but for my research, I'm interested in the nationalism aspect. The drivers and the cars became symbols of modernity and success for a new Germany Hitler was creating. International competition created proof of Nazi superiority on the motoring front. The Silver Arrows and the racing team through extensive propaganda were a vision of a modern Nazi Germany. However, this creates a problem due to the contradictory nature of Nazi ideology and modernity. To put succinctly, Nazism was a political ideology in Germany during the 1930s, which proclaimed the superiority of the Aryan race. Associated with the Volkgemeinschaft or people's community was the slogan blood and Boden or blood and soil. This romanticized the idea of the peasant farmer and a return to land. This looking backwards ideology is contrasted though by the motorization policies and the modernity the cars represented. Careful reframing and stressing of the historical legacy of the car in Germany aided in bridging this discrepancy. Unfortunately, I cannot cover the full extent of this complex relationship in today's presentation. So the silver arrows were a key symbol of Nazi German pride, modernity and nationalism. In the British motor magazine, Motorsport, they associated the victories of the German silver racing cars with Germany's turn to motorization under Hitler. The silver arrows became the pinnacle of German automotive industry. The German racing teams, it was suggested by Motorsport, were run principally to raise the prestige and to demonstrate the power, efficiency and strength of Germany all over the world. In international sport, the setting enables one nation to compare itself against other nations. For motorsport, not only could they compare the sport craft of racing, but also the technology held by each nation. This connection between the silver arrows, German identity and victory was quickly established and propagandized for the German public. For the Nazi government, motorizing provided a bounty of propaganda. The racing successes and its reflected glory all of which are broadcast to the nation, on state provided radios, screened in films, and printed in the news. According to Neil Bascombe, Adolf Hunlein, the Corps Führer for the NSKK, took every opportunity to herald the country's dominance at the Grand Prix. As he believed, racing is, and always will be, the highest embodiment of motorsport, and thus the highest achievement of the nation in international competition. One example of symbolism of silver arrows and Nazi German nationalism is a presentation of the cars at the International Automobile and Motorcycle Exhibition. They are metallic emblems of progress which were encased in a pageantry to highlight German ingenuity and success. On the slide is an advertisement for the exhibition in motorsport from February of 1935. Behind the landscapes and landmarks of Berlin is one of the land speed record cars towering above the cityscape the car is emerging from the capital, representing the new future emerging from the political centre of Germany. As reported in the Times, these exhibitions are not international, but highlight the German first-class craftsmanship and inventiveness. On this slide is an image of the Mercedes-Benz Grand Prix car at the 1935 International Automobile and Motorcycle Show displayed in the Hall of Fame exhibition. The car is situated two, between two pillars, which on the walls are plaques detailing the successes of the car with the insignia of the NSKK. Below the car is a laurel wreath, which is an ancient Greek symbol for triumph, and positioned above the car is the Imperial Eagle of Germany with the swat sticker and the bird's talons. The foreground shows lights, which are reminiscent of fireballs, and although not shown from this angle, there are guards surrounding the vehicle. The staging, according to Julia Grossberger, generates a sense that the cars are meant to be viewed as objects of veneration, not for inspection. The light of the Hall of Fame combines a museum with a hero shrine. The quasi sacral elements of the reef, imperial eagle, lights, plaque, and honor guards provide the appearance that the cars are lying in state. These cars are transformed into symbols of German greatness and superiority. So given the heroic staging of the cars, the drivers also had to match those qualities and be the right character to drive Germany to victory. The German racing drivers became part of a new sociocultural class, the sporting celebrity. 
they are praised for their heroism and willingness to sacrifice oneself for the nation. A young driver school had been set up to foster German talent rather than force German teams to hire foreign drivers. This shows an aspiration of a national team in which the driver identity matches the identity of the manufacturer. However, as we mentioned later with Richard Seaman, this cohesive national identity could be relegated as driver talent may have been more important. So of all the German drivers in this period, Chris Nixon comments that Bernard Reismeyer was probably the most used driver by the Nazi government. However, why was Reismeyer used more compared to other drivers? What was the appeal of Reismeyer for the Nazi regime? An explanation is the hero narrative that was easily constructed around Reismeyer. He came from humble origins to the 1936 European Drivers Champion. He was a successful and talented racer, but at the same time fitted the mold of what a German athlete and a German male should strive to be. We know the phrase, heroes are created for when they are required. And for post First World War Germany and a new government, heroes were needed. For Nazi Germany, a hero needed to be physically fit, mentally strong and successful. The horrors of the First World War so men returning home with shell shock and war wounds. Thus, Reismeyer needed to represent a new Germany, one that was both physically and mentally fit to withstand modernity and the possible horrors associated with the modern technological war. The creation of male heroes like Reismeyer were credited with the will and the resolve that gave him the ability to use his car as a weapon in battle. Reismeyer symbolized a new era for Germany his victories in America and in Europe were seen as tangible proof of a rise of a new modern Germany. His death on the 28th of January, 1938, during a landscape record attempt, provided an important propaganda spectacle for the regime. A soldier doing his utmost to represent the honor and glory of Germany. His death was treated like a period of mourning. Unlike most years, there was no procession of the cars through Berlin prior to the motor show in respect of Rosemeyer's death. His death was reframed in every aspect. It was not a foolhardy speed test. Instead, as Fritz Todd, the director of the construction of the Autobahn stated, he died as a soldier in the exercise of his duty. According to a report in Motorsport, Hitler referred in his speech to the national loss sustained by the death of this great driver. Neil Baskin highlights Rosemeyer was even likened to Siegfried the dragon slaying hero of German mythology. Even in death, Rosanne's fatal accident was transformed and mythicized into a hero and soldier narrative. Now in Britain, on the other hand, the racing community desired to have a car that could race against the Silver Arrows. They believed Britain should and needed to develop a racing team to uphold British nationalism abroad. The success of Napier in the pre-war period and then the victories of the Bentley boys in the 1920s reflected a historical precedent of British ability to produce winning cars. Unfortunately, British manufacturers could not produce a car suitable to compete within the regulations for the 1930s. The amateurism of the Bentley boys and the Napier drivers could explain part of the setback. Amateurism was this belief in fair play and that sport should not involve material gain. This, combined with the financial issues of becoming a driver, meant that racing in Britain was restricted to those who could afford it and had time to participate in it. This was completely different to Germany, where in Germany the drivers were selected because of talent and were paid to drive. For the motoring press, the British government were responsible for Britain's failings. In motorsport, they believed that there was an assured popularity to motor racing among the general public of Great Britain but the opposition by the powers that be inhibited the ability for motor racing to become a national sport. The government had not provided funding for racing, nor as seen in the House of Lords supported it. While it is unlikely that there was an assured popularity to the sport in Britain, given its limited attention in the mainstream press, there does seem to be a lack of understanding in what motor racing could offer the nation. 
The British government, from the perspective of the press, did not understand the prestige motor racing could offer Britain. Following the 1938 Donington Grand Prix, it was reported in speed that it has apparently come home to many people that a successful Grand Prix racing team of cars and drivers can do much to enhance the prestige of any country and thereby influence that country internationally. So as has been discussed, nationalism and politics were becoming part of Grand Prix racing in the period. This section will now explore the interaction between Germany and Britain in motor racing. Richard John Batty Seaman was a British driver who raced for the Mercedes-Benz team from 1937 to 1939. Given the previous discussion on creating a driver academy in Germany and the want to have German drivers racing German cars, it's curious why the German team would agree to hire Seaman. Whether it solely be his talent, it remains unknown. Seaman's most successful moment was winning the 1938 German Grand Prix. This was the first time a British driver had won a Continental Grand Prix since Major Sir Henry Seagrave in 1923. Evidence of his British identity was seen through his English green helmet and radiated grill. Frequently stated by Simmons' wife and friends was that he resisted the idea that politics was involved in motor racing. But as will be shown, this was impossible given the climate of the times. Tensions between Britain and Germany over Czechoslovakia, also known as the Munich Crisis in 1938, led to the postponement of the 1938 Donington Grand Prix, which is meant to be held on the 1st of October. This event produced a situation in which drivers had to acknowledge the involvement of politics and sport. Both the Mercedes-Benz and auto union teams had stayed until the very last possible chance. On reflection in motorsport, the correspondent called Auslander states, the Munich crisis of September last year showed us how the German racing teams were determined to carry on to the very last moment. So they only departed from Donington when war was really imminent. The Munich crisis highlights the driver's opinions on motor racing and the belief of remaining apolitical in sports. However, there was a mounting sense that motor racing could not, as they believe, remain apolitical or even continue to occur. During Seaman's speech to the Royal Automobile Club in London, prior to the Donington Grand Prix, he stated that he is frequently asked why he races a German car. Aside from love of sport, he states, motor racing knows no frontiers, and it would be a calamity if the political situation interfered with that. This was met with cheers from both the German and British racing drivers. Unfortunately, politics often naturally becomes involved in sport, regardless of athlete desires. On March 15th, 1939, German troops crossed the Czechoslovak border and occupied Prague. The mounting political tensions in Germany made Simon realize that sport was incapable of being kept separate from politics. As recounted by Mr. Neubauer, the team manager for Mercedes-Benz, Simon was finding it difficult as an Englishman to carry on working for a German firm. Simon recalled the previous motor show in which, at Hitler's request, the teams had to parade the racing cars at the Reich Chancellery and shake the hand of the Führer. For Simon, he could hear, still hear Hitler's words about the fearless racing drivers who risked their lives not just for the love of the sport, but for the honour of Germany. As politics are becoming inseparable from sport, Seaman consulted Lord Howe, the president of the British Racing Drivers Club, who himself conferred with several people in government, parliament and business. Lord Howe's response was that any personal contact with Germany was valuable and she maintained. Eventually, with the Anglo-French guarantee of Poland and the German repudiation of the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, Seaman wrote to Lord Howe, as I now hear that Anglo-German and Franco-German sporting events are either been forbidden or frowned upon by the authorities, I'm naturally wondering if the time has not come when I ought to give up driving for Mercedes. Given the tone of the letters, Simon understood the political situation. In the final letters from Simon, there's a sense of disillusionment and not wanting to do Hitler's racing bidding anymore. Unfortunately, we'll never know if Simon was prepared to leave the team 
as he died at the 1939 Belgium Grand Prix. Yet, he might have not needed to give up his Grand Prix dreams if there was an English auto union. Reported in a biography written by fellow racer and friend, Prince Chula Jacopong, Simon was driving a German car for the joys of handling the finest racing machines and exiting, and also to add to his own personal glory, as he waited in vain for a British Grand Prix challenger. The British racing community wanted a car to match the Silver Arrows. They saw Germany taking the sport seriously and seeing its value for national prestige. For example, this article in Motorsport on the slide asks for an English auto union. It calls for a coordinated effort of British manufacturers to follow in auto union's footsteps and unite under one team. Prestige in comparison to other nations, especially in fields related to technology, would show superiority. When reported from Speed states, perhaps if it was seen that England were losing her laurels in the records field, it would wake us up to the fact that in these days, we cannot afford to ignore any form of achievement upon which rests some sort of prestige. These calls on the British motor racing community highlight the failures of British racing industry and performance abroad. Order Hume also spoke to the magazine The Motor between November 1938 and January of 1939 regarding British Grand Prix racing prospects. In a letter titled The Opinion of Mr. Werner, the Director of Auto Union, on the question of building British racing cars dealt with in the magazine The Motor, he regrets that Britain has not been represented at a Grand Prix. For constructing racing cars is, as Werner considers, the foremost of his national duties. At one point he states, for the, in the racing sport, not only the chivalrous combat between man and man is decisive, but of equal importance are his helpers and his tool, the racing car, back of which must stand the intellectual and physical efficiency of the nation. Now, this could possibly link back to the discussion on Roy's Meyer needing to physically and mentally fit for the challenges of modernity. Given that Germany did have a successful racing team, were they challenging Britain's efficiency in a motorized conflict? This communication between Order Union and the British press does raise the question of motive. For the British press, they might have been seeking advice from the premier racing teams in the hopes of eventually racing against them and maybe beating them. But the benefits from Order Union seem unclear. Another assumption can be that having a British racing team, it would be another team for Germany to beat. After years of civil arrow dominance, other nations were unable to keep up. Having another team to set dominance paper would add to the prestige and national pride in Germany. While politics did interfere with the running of the Grand Prix, the drivers and teams saw a policy of no politics in sport. This aspiration seems hypocritical, especially from the Silver Arrows, who from the past years had been involved in Hitler's motorization plans and propaganda. It does raise the question of choice though. Did the Silver Arrows want to be involved in politics and the nationalistic propaganda of the regime or merely race cars for the joys of racing? Motor racing did not occur in a vacuum independent of the social, political, or cultural changes occurring in the 1930s. Rather, it was reshaped and influenced by the climate of the times. It was not only the sport itself, but the fans, racing community, and drivers, which also adapted to the shifting nature of the sport. As the perception of speeds, oh, sorry, as the perception of civilization rested on speeds, motor racing in the 1930s became entangled with politics and the rising tensions of the periods. And that concludes my presentation for today. I just wanted to thank once again the International Motor Racing Research Centre um, for organising the symposium and making it possible for me to present. Um, also to Silverstone Interactive Museum and Archive for their research and archives. And obviously to my professor, David Barry. Um, and yeah, for further information or for references or questions, please feel free to contact me. So yeah, that's it. Thank you, Katie.
I hope you heard the applause. A bit, yeah, thank you so much. Okay. All right, I'm going to go out in the audience with a remote mic and see if we have questions. Stand by. Okay. Anybody? Mr. Caps, and then... A very nice uh, analysis interpretation. Would your analysis interpretation shifted if you had looked at it more on the towards the comparing with the French or the Italians rather than Great Britain? Sir, I can't really hear it that well. Um, Katie, Don Caps is asking, would your analysis or conclusions shifted any if you had looked, uh, for example, at Italians and the French? Italians and the French. I am. Um, I think the Italians were quite similar to Nazi Germany. I think it might have been more um, the British and French might have experienced something quite similar. Um, my research just didn't extend to those nations just because of language difficulties. Um, and I thought it's quite interesting, especially with Germany and Britain in this pre-war period or before the Second World War, um, with just the rise of like different industries and how it, but I mean, yeah, I mean, ideally it'd be fantastic to have a look at all of the countries and seeing how they kind of interact with each other. Um, I mean, I do know that between France and Italy, there was some um, events where the French did ban the Italians from racing, um, which I think was a bit more than what happened between Germany and Britain. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. We have another question. Please just go ahead, speak your question. Uh Was Richard Seaman a spy? Um, maybe, I don't know. I, we can't find his personal papers. Um, it'd be a pretty cool story. I do know that there was, um, for example, a British motorcyclist who were part of the war office racing in Germany up until the start of the Second World War. So I guess they're kind of more spyish. Um, it could be a possibility. We won't. I, this is the thing with these sources is that we never know the full extent of his background and everything. Um. Let's try that. See if she can hear with the microphone. Okay. Let's see if this works. Hold on one sec. So an interesting presentation about the pre-war, uh, British versus Germany. Uh, I, I wonder what you'd comment about the post-war. Uh, BRM fiasco compared to the resurgence of the Mercedes after the war. Was that a parallel kind of situation? So I missed the first part. Um, is that? She got most of it, though. That's good. <laughs> Just, speak. Just speak right into it. So I want you to compare the pre war uh, Germany versus Britain with the post war. BRM fiasco while Mercedes had tremendous resurgence in 55, 54, 55. Do, do, yeah. do you see a parallel there? I mean, I haven't really looked in the post-war period at the moment because um, this, this is just one chapter in my PhD thesis. I mean, it'd be an interesting thing to look at. Um, so it's something different to look into. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, even looking at like, obviously, German identity changed post-war with the divide between East and West. Um, so that kind of taken a bit of a, a different political opinions. Um, yeah, I don't really know, but I'm happy to look into it because it does sound quite fascinating. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Katie. Anyone else? Uh, just a moment, Katie. Hi, Katie. Can you uh, hear me if I'm speaking in this mic here? I don't know if she can really hear me. Can, Katie, can you hear the questioner? Okay, she's going to come up to the podium. 
Folks are going to have to do that. Anybody has questions, just walk up here, please. Sorry. Hi, Katie. My Hi. name's Lauren Goodman. I actually was doing a lot of research on French Grand Prix driving in the interwar period. So yeah. I'm so excited to hear more about the German perspective. In your research, um, were you finding that Auto Union and Mercedes, were they were the high ups real believers in the NSKK and Nazi ideology, or were they kind of doing it because they wanted the money that Hitler had on the table? Do you have any sense of what their feeling was about that? Thanks. I I think it was a bit of both because I from the sources that I read, the money really wasn't that much compared to what they needed, um, and definitely I did a lot more looking at auto union rather than Mercedes because there are a few books on Mercedes written. Um, so I did like a lot, I went to the auto union archives and stuff in Germany. And I think there is a belief in it. And I think it's more accommodating to the regime because they are, they do offer that their workers time to go to like the rallies um, and things like that. And I do think they do see it as nationalistic. And I don't know if it's nationalistic in related to Nazism or nationalistic as related to pride in Germany and sort of the rise of German motor racing, especially with like the invention of the car, like showing that's progression to that kind of point. Um, so it's quite hard because, yeah, you'd never know if they're fully supportive of the Nazi regime or they're just kind of doing it. Um, there are certain drivers, and I think a lot of them were more just playing the system, just trying to make the most of it, especially I get that feeling with um, Hans Stuck a bit. I think he's kind of just playing the political power to kind of get what he wants. Um, I don't really, I mean, Richard Seaman really wasn't that supportive of Nazism. He was more just, I'm here to race. Um, yeah, it's a bit, yeah, you can never really know, but I do think it's more pride in national, like and nationalism in Germany rather than supporting fully the the Nazi regime and I think it would be those in the NSKK that were more like supportive of Nazism and seeing that uh, yeah that's probably the best way I could explain it but it is definitely something quite interesting to explore. Anyone else? Katie, we have uh, another question. Gordon White's walking up to the podium. Oh, very nice presentation. Could it be said that the British pursued aircraft development through the Schneider Cup and the Supermarine Company, uh, which led to the development of the Spitfire, which might even have been more significant than what the Germans were doing? I think that is a possibility. I think it might have just been, yeah, looking elsewhere rather than focusing on motor racing. But even you look at like the, automob like the automobile industry in Britain, it's still kind of increasing in that period. But it's just developing those technologies. And I don't know if how the British government were kind of dealing with post Great Depression, preparing for a future war, that kind of stuff. And maybe they just didn't have the time to develop a racing car and defend land speed records. They just have that. They wanted to focus on more, more preparations, more about the people of Britain rather than a sport, which is fair enough. Um, that's kind of, yeah, I think they just had other things to which are a high priority to maintain in that society rather than build a fast car. Um, Thank you very much. No worries. Thanks, Gordon. Anyone else? Jim, come on up. Katie, another question. So fabulous work. It stimulates way too many questions, but uh, I'll restrain Sorry. myself to one. Um, uh, bring your analytical focus to the present day. I would mm -hmm. suspect that Formula One would say it's a transnational enterprise now. Uh, and yet, of course, drivers are identified by their nationalities. We hear the national anthems. Uh, you know, but on the third hand, of course, these are um, uh, corporations uh, that are all 
um, globe spanning, not necessarily identified by the nation state. So a simple question would be, uh, what is the place of nationalism in Formula One racing today? Well, that is the entirety of my thesis I'm looking at. Um, so it's, I think nationalism is a part of Formula One. And even with this globalization and transnational guys at the very heart of any kind of sport or anything in society, we do have an attachment to a nation and we do attach nationalism to it. Um, and so my, my research for my PhD thesis does start, so I'm actually starting pre-First War and I go up to the present day, is the goal with different case studies and sort of even the recent case studies, yeah, we've got this massive sort of traveling circus of Formula One going to these different countries and different cities, but th there is nationalism. Like you look at the Tifosi, you look at the people who support like Max Verstappen's fans from the Dutch side, you look at the British Grand Prix, that there is nationalism. And I mean, even if we're just flagging it with the national anthem or the flags or the colors, it is still nationalism getting printed. And I, I always get reminded of um, Michael Billig's for now nationalism and this idea of like the flag, even if it's just silently in the building, it is still reminding us that we belong to a nation and we know that that's a nation. We know that we've got our own nation. So I, I do think Formula One is nationalistic and it tries to pretend that it isn't and it will always be involved in nationalism and politics because um, that's the nature of sport and Formula One. Um, but yeah, that's the end. That's, that's my goal for my research, for my PhD. So it's a few more chapters to go till we get to that point in time. Um, but yeah, no, um, it's fascinating. So. Thank you, Katie. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much, Katie. Thank you so much. And now that it's 11 o'clock at night, you can, 11.15 at night, you can probably call it a day. <laughs> I think so, definitely, right. yeah. We, thank we, you so much. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing from you uh, um, in the future. Uh, the symposium or your writings, please keep in touch with us, and we'll keep in touch with you. Yeah, definitely. Feel, please feel free to contact me with any email, like email address. It was on the screen, right. or contact yes. one of the... While, I, while I've been sitting watching, uh, hear, hearing you talk and watching you, I've gotten two emails from members uh, at home asking how to contact you. So, yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah, happy to discuss anything okay. related to motor racing and nationalism. Right. They're it's both racing guys. Okay. So, all right. <laughs> Thanks again, Katie. You take care. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. bye.